I want to say it's a great blessing to be with you today, and I want to thank you for coming. It seems that many of you have come from all over Norway, uh, sorry, Denmark, and some from Norway and other places, and uh, I'm very glad to see you, and uh, many of you are old friends, emphasis on friends. Um, and I just thank the Lord for the opportunity to share with you once again today from the Holy Scriptures. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 39. And we will carry on with the story of Joseph. We've learned that Joseph has now accepted the promises of God to his father and grandfather and great-grandfather as promises of his own, made to him personally. And friends, the, scriptures that, the promises that God has given us in Scripture are also made unto us personally. We cannot think of them as promises for other people. We have to think of them as promises of God to ourselves individually. God has promised me these things that we read, that I read in Scripture, because the promises of God are meant to give us not only strength to face trials, temptations, problems, issues, difficulties, but the promises of God are also made to encourage us to be faithful to God no matter what. And perhaps that's the most important thing. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, it says in verse 1, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. I want you to think about this for a minute. The slave market in the big city of Ramses. Here are the slaves standing on the platform. And most of them are bowed down and dejected. And they are looking forward to a life of misery and a life of chattel property. But there is one who stands erect and confident, and he senses a purpose in his life, because God has already appointed him a sense of that purpose. He stands there, he looks confident, he senses a presence in his life that is not present with the others. As Potiphar, for one reason or another, needs a slave, perhaps his assets have grown so much that he needs more help, perhaps he's lost one of his slaves, maybe to death, or maybe he was disobedient and he killed him, I don't know, I have no idea, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to the slave or to the, why Joseph was, or why Potiphar needed another slave. But we learn that Potiphar came to the slave market, and it says he bought Joseph from the hand of the Ishmaelites. You can imagine there the people milling about at the slave market. And when Potiphar comes along, they step back. I mean, Potiphar <coughs> is a very powerful man. Notice what it says Potiphar is. He is the captain of the guard. Now that means that Potiphar is in charge of protecting Pharaoh. He is the security, he's capital security for Potiphar and all of his palace. In fact, nobody goes in to see Potiphar without the approval of, sorry, nobody goes to see Pharaoh without the approval of Potiphar. Potiphar does the security checks at the entrance to the palace. Or he does, or he and his guards, the men that work with him, make sure that there are no knives hidden in the clothing of those who come, that there's no poison stuck inside the pocket somewhere, that there's no other threatening uh, device that could do damage to the king. Pot that's Potiphar's role. And I can tell you that Pharaoh needed a man he could trust. So he wasn't going to pay Potiphar a pittance for his 
services. Potiphar was paid very richly. He had many assets. He had houses and lands and properties, fields, where he could grow his produce and his grains. Potiphar was a man also of stature. He was not just a servant, so to speak. Potiphar, you see, money doesn't always buy loyalty. It's important, but it doesn't always buy total loyalty. So in order to have Potiphar's loyalty, Pharaoh had brought Potiphar in as one of his inner circle, one of his counselors, one of the men who was responsible to guide the nation in the affairs of state. So Potiphar was no common person. He was wealthy. He, had, he dressed as if he was an, an official in the government. He, he was the general, so to speak, of the, of the uh, security of the Egyptian palace. Now, the Bible tells us that this man, Potiphar, bought Joseph. And no doubt as he came into the, into the slave market that day, the people separated and spread apart, prepared a path for him to go down to visit with the the, the ones who were to sell the slaves. I don't suspect that Joseph was put up for auction. Because when Potiphar looked at the, the spread of slaves on the platform, he, his eye, no doubt, began to focus on Joseph. Because after all, he was the only one that was standing erect. He looked confident, and he seemed to think that there was something special about this particular slave. And when the slave seller saw Potiphar coming to the market, he thought, oh, today I'm going to have a good day. They talked and made a deal. No doubt Potiphar paid plenty for Joseph, but no matter what Potiphar would have paid, no matter how much he would have put out there for this particular slave, he would have had the best deal he's ever made in all his life. This was no ordinary slave, as Potiphar was soon to find out. And it says in verse 2, I want you to notice what it says. It says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Now, what does this word prosperous mean? Prosperous means that you, at least to human beings, when we think of business, a prosperous business is a business that makes a lot of money. And there's profit. And the business owner is wealthy. This is a prosperous man to human eyes. But Joseph <coughs> was not wealthy. Joseph didn't have any money. Joseph didn't even have control over his time. He only wore the clothes that he was given. He was chattel property. He was not his own man. He had to do what he was told when he was told to do it. And no doubt he started cleaning toilets or whatever, I don't know. Some menial tasks. But he did them so well that Potiphar noticed this, is, this slave is different from my other slaves. And perhaps Joseph began to make suggestions to Potiphar to improve his business or his affairs in his household. You know, if you do it this way, you'll actually get more benefit from it. Or if you, if you change the way you market this, it will actually produce more profit. You know, whatever, I don't know. Joseph may well have given Potiphar advice that was very good for his affairs. Whatever the case, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. Now, prosperity, according to God, is not rooted in money. Prosperity, according to God, is rooted in faithfulness to God. Amen? Amen? If you are faithful to Christ, you will 
be a prosperous man or woman. I guarantee it. You may be a slave. <laughs> you may be cleaning houses. You may be working in menial tasks and not making much money. But you will be prosperous. God promises that to you. That's one of the promises of God. You can prosper if you are faithful to God. Verse 3. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Wow! In other words, whatever Joseph did, it was done as if he was doing it for himself. Or for God, really. You see, Potiphar would have seen Joseph acting as if he was Potiphar himself. And that he would make the best decisions, the same decisions that Potiphar would have made. And this impressed Potiphar. And Potiphar saw that there was something more than just ordinary with Joseph. He saw that the Lord was with him. This man has divine help. He could see that Joseph was special, more special than anyone he'd ever met before. And he was very impressed with Joseph's life. Verse 4, Joseph found grace in his sight, you know. When a man causes another man to prosper, he is a good friend. And he wants to help him. And Joseph found grace in Potiphar's sight, and he served him and made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into Joseph's hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Oh, wow. In other words, look what it says. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. So in other words, everything that Potiphar owned increased in value. His assets grew and his, his, his value, his property, his estate expanded. And um, Joseph was responsible for it. Boy, this was the best deal he'd ever made. In fact, he trusted Joseph so much that he left all that he had into Joseph's hands and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. Wow. Can you imagine? You know, there's three different kinds of workers in this world. There are the number three workers which try to just do enough so that they get a paycheck. The number two worker is the one who needs to be instructed, but he does it. Whatever he's instructed to do, he does it. Um, he doesn't look for things that need to be done. The number one worker is the one who works as if he is the owner of the business. He looks for things to do. He tries to find things that with, and, and do things without being told. And consequently, his employer trusts him. And the more he trusts him, the better the relationship becomes. I have to tell you, I have a staff member like that in my organization. She is... Um, very, very faithful. She does all that I ask her to do, and then she does much more that I don't ask her to do, and she looks after my affairs as if they are her affairs. I tell you, I wish I had all of my staff members that way. <laughs> That's a number one worker. Joseph was a number one worker, as we call them. Then it says in verse 7, 
well, verse 6, notice that it says Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored. In other words, Joseph was very handsome. Joseph was very attractive. And I want you to notice something about Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37 is dealing with the relationships within the church. Now in Genesis chapter 39, we learn how Joseph related in relationships to the world. Because Egypt was a, was a worldly country. It had worldly philosophies. Egypt was a country that was very corrupt. In fact, there were scandals everywhere, especially in the palace. You know, sex scandals, financial scandals, all sorts of scandals going on in Egypt. It sounds something perhaps like the world today. We have the same problems today. And so it should be no surprise that Potiphar's wife who was no Christian, <laughs> she was a worldly person, she cast her eyes on Joseph. It says in verse 7, and she said, lie with me. Come sleep with me. And he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, my master knows not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand, and there is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me except thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Oh, it's not just a sin against Pharaoh, it's a sin against God. Immorality, my brothers and sisters, is a sin against God. And today, even many Christians do not understand the nature of morality. And they think it's okay. I was just uh, reporting on a briefing the other day. Actually, it was yesterday. Uh, or at least it, it will probably go up to our website on Monday. where a famous, well-respected pollster in America interviewed Christian people concerning their ideas about morality. And he pointed out that the concept of living together unmarried or having a fornication or relationships outside of marriage are increasingly common among even Christians who see no problem in violating God's law concerning morality. And he was pointing out that the reason for this is because they don't study their Bibles. They may call themselves Christians, they go to church on Sunday or Saturday for whatever, whichever day it is that they attend, and they claim that they are the children of God, yet they do not know their Bibles, and they do not understand the principles of morality. He was reporting on this as an objective research. And that's, his organization is all about researching things related to Christianity. <coughs> Pardon me. So D Joseph, however, understood. He had a very high understanding of the principles, and he knew that doing anything with his wife, with Potiphar's wife, would be a sin against God. Verse 10. Oh, by the way, he could not compromise his loyalty to God. You see, and in the last days, my friends, we will have a test of loyalty as well. God will put you through a test of loyalty. He'll put me through a test of loyalty. Each of us will have to demonstrate our loyalty to God publicly. You cannot do it privately alone. You have to publicly demonstrate your loyalty. That's what the Sunday law is all about. So Joseph, in a way, not only represents or is a type of Christ, he is also a type of those who are living in the last days. 
So it came to pass that she spake to Joseph day by day, and he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do business. And there was none of the men of the house there with him. Joseph was wearing a outer coat. This was not the coat that his father made for him. This was another coat. It was a coat that Potiphar had given to him. And the Bible says, verse 12, that it came to pass that she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. <laughs> Do you think Joseph did the right thing? Of course he did. She wasn't going to let go of his coat, so he left his coat and fled. Now Joseph's coat is going to get him into trouble again. For the second time in his life, his coat, his troublesome coat, is going to get him in great difficulty with Potiphar. Because it came to pass, verse 13, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. She lied. So not only do the church brethren lie, so do the people of the world. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You know, my friends, you cannot even trust your colleagues at work. You know, um, there was a famous man, his name was Billy Graham. Anybody remember Billy Graham? He, di he died recently. And you can actually go on the website and watch his funeral. Um, but you don't want to watch most of it because it's all uh, two hours of it. Most of it, uh, two hours and 20 minutes is where the funeral starts <laughs> because they were recording all the people coming to the funeral. It was a private funeral, but they had at least 1,500 people. <laughs> yeah, so... It's huge. Even Mr. Trump attended the funeral, as did Vice President Mike Pence and their wives. So this was a, but, but Billy Graham had a policy. He would never go into an elevator alone with a woman, other than his wife. And he would never go into a hotel room first. Always one of his aides would go in the hotel room first and make sure there was nobody else in there and that he, they would always be with him when he came in the room. This is a moral principle that's very high. Very few people have had that opportunity to do that kind of thing. But um, Billy Graham... Never, was never caught in any kind of compromised situation. Now, when Potiphar came home, she spoke unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us, he came into me to mock me. Verse 18, And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, which was fake news, false testimony, that he became angry, it says. His wrath was kindled. Verse 20, Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Did Joseph defend himself to Potiphar? We have no evidence that Joseph defended himself to Potiphar. You see, if Joseph would have defended himself to Potiphar, 
This would have created a scandal, and Potiphar would have then had to choose, is he going to believe Joseph, or is he going to believe his wife? And if he doesn't believe his wife and he believes Joseph, that's going to create a problem between Potiphar and his wife. Joseph loved Potiphar, and Potiphar loved Joseph. Joseph was not prepared to put Potiphar in that kind of situation. So he accepted the punishment, even though it was unjust and unfair and unrighteous. Somehow, Potiphar perhaps did not kill Joseph because Potiphar loved Joseph. And something must not have added up. This is not Joseph. Joseph is not like that. But yet, Potiphar could not confront his wife. Otherwise, that would create a problem for them too. So Joseph was silent when he was sent to the second prison of his life. What was the first prison? The pit, the well, that's right, in the, in the wilderness out where his brothers were. This was now the second prison of his life. Now, what had God done so far with Joseph? First of all, God cut down Joseph's pride by his brothers. God brought him down three steps, as I told you before, and now a fourth step as a slave. So four steps down, Joseph went from being the favored child in the church to a slave in the world. Christ came to this earth. He stepped off of his throne, his, his glorious throne, and became a human being. Went lower than the angels. He stepped down. Christ also suffered abuse. He ended up, as it were, in the prison of human flesh which he has never been relieved of even after returning to his Father in heaven. He will always have human flesh and the marks of his suffering. Christ was stripped and beaten by his brethren and, and the world. He both, well, his brethren set it up and the world beat him. The church organized with the state in order to persecute Christ. That is exactly what's going to happen in the last days with God's people. Just I thought I'd throw that in. And then Christ went the fourth step and suffered the death on the cross. So there were four steps in Joseph's coming down, and there were four steps in Christ's coming down, perhaps more. In either case, they, one is the type, the other is the antitype. Now, let's think about God's people in the last days. If you are faithful to Christ, you will eventually be accused and cut down in your life. You will lose your assets. You will come down. You will lose all your assets. You will lose all your stature in the community, all of your hard-earned reputation. You will be put in prison, and you will be persecuted, and some of you will be killed because you refuse to compromise with the law of God. In fact, there are four steps, at least, that God's people will come down in the last great crisis. So Joseph represents both Christ and the last people in the last days. And now we see that Joseph is in prison. Again, the thing about it is, God cut down Joseph by his brothers, and then he resurrected Joseph and made him the governor of 
Potiphar's house. Then God cut Joseph down again. And God is the doer of all this. We cannot blame human beings. It is God who knows what we need. It is God who knows how to cut us down and then raise us up. For with every crucifixion, my friends, there is always a resurrection. Hello? Do you hear what I said? With every crucifixion, there is always a resurrection. That has become the motto of my own life because of this story. And I have seen it happen in my life and in the lives of other people over and over and over and over again. When God cuts you down, he will raise you up. Maybe it'll take some years and some time in order for it to happen. But don't blame, don't grumble, don't complain. Joseph did not grumble and complain. He took the promise of the stars and he made it his own promise that God would one day raise him up. And that's happened to me in my life and I'm sure that for many of you it has happened in your lives as well. Remember that. With every crucifixion, there's always what? A resurrection. Expect it. It is a promise of God to you and to me. Joseph is in prison. But it says in verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph. You know, prosperity doesn't come in your own strength. Prosperity does not come by your own mind or your own capabilities. It comes by the power of God in your life. That's the only way you can have true prosperity is by having God control your life. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all of the prisoners that were in the prison. Imagine giving a prisoner charge over all the prisoners. Has anybody ever done that at any other time in, in history? I don't know. I somehow don't think so. This is unique. Since when is a prisoner in, put in charge of all the prisoners? That's extremely unusual. And whatsoever they did there, Joseph was the doer of it. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison looked not on anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper, even in prison. Not only was he a slave, he was now a prisoner slave and he still prospered. Wow, yeah, how much lower can you get and, and, and still prosper? I don't think there's anything lower than being a prisoner and a slave at the same time. And yet God prospered, and everything he did, he made it to prosper. Prosperity is something far different than what we normally think, isn't it, my friends? Prosperity is not in the usual way. True prosperity, prosperity that comes from God, is in these things in this relationship that we have with God, in this loyalty that we have to God, in this experience that we have with God. The keeper of the prison looked not unto anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. The keeper of the prison went on holiday. <laughs> he left Joseph in charge and went on holiday. He and his family had a good time at the beach while Joseph was managing the prison. <laughs> you know, I, he wasn't even concerned. Joseph would take care of everything. Well, you know, it came to pass, I'm not going to go through all the details of chapter 40, but the butler and the baker somehow offended the king and he put them in Potiphar's prison. Now you have to understand, this prison where Joseph was, was actually on the property of Potiphar. <coughs> Potiphar <coughs> was the captain of the guard. 
and the captain of the guard needed to have some place on his own premises where he could manage anyone that needed to be kept or detained for one reason or another. So there was a prison there right on his property, and Joseph was put in this prison. And so when the king had a complaint against the butler and the baker, he told the complaint to Potiphar. Potiphar arrested these two men and put them in his prison with Joseph. And in the middle of the night one night, these two men had a dream. And they woke up in the morning and they were deeply distressed and their faces were very concerned. And when Joseph came around to check on the prison, you know, perhaps there's one, person, one prisoner that was not in the cell, that would be Joseph. He would go around and check on all the other prisoners in the morning and often he would bring them cheer in the midst of their sorrow. You know, I mean, after all, prisons are not pleasant places to live. I don't know of any prison that's really very plush, but I suppose there is one somewhere. <laughs> but the prison in Potiphar's house was nothing. But Joseph was not kept in a prison cell. He was perhaps in the warden's quarters, even though he himself was a prisoner. He could walk out of that prison at any time. Yet he stayed there because that's where God had put him. Think about this. He might have said, oh, well, Potiphar was the one that put me here. I will go and I'll get free and I'll leave the city and I'll run back to Jerusalem. Or not Jerusalem. I'll run back to uh, Hebron. <coughs> Pardon me. I'll run back to Hebron and I'll be back with my family and my friends and I won't be in this place anymore. Uh, not Joseph. You see, Joseph did not run from God's will, even if it was painful for him. Joseph did not turn his back on God's purposes, even though they were not pleasant. So Joseph came along that morning, and, and here were these two prisoners in deep distress. And they tell him his dreams, he interprets the dreams, and the butler is restored to his position, and the baker is executed, just exactly as Joseph has said they would. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 14. When the, he tells the butler his dream, Joseph says to him, But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. Oh. <laughs> Here's the man who could have gone on his own volition. But he asks Pharaoh, or he asks the butler to somehow help him to get out of the prison, legally, properly. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into this dungeon. This is where he defends himself. Remember that at the time when Potiphar put him in prison, he did not defend himself. He was silent as Jesus was when they crucified him. Christ was a lamb they went to the slaughter. Joseph was the same, silent. But now he says to this man, I didn't do anything that I deserve to be here. But it says in verse 30, uh, 23, after he restored the butler, it says that Yet it did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. What a terrible word, forgot. Have you ever forgotten somebody? <laughs> have you forgotten to do something that you promised somebody you would do? I think all of us perhaps have done this. We've let people down, and the butler let Joseph down. But let me ask you a question. If the butler would have said something to Potiphar right away, do you think that this would have been God's purpose? 
Yeah, maybe he would have gotten out of prison, but then what? You see, God somehow, for in, in his infinite wisdom, knew that Joseph needed more time in prison. <laughs> he needed perhaps to encourage other prisoners. God needed him to, to use him in some way in the prison that the Bible doesn't explain to us. You see, we don't always understand why God puts us through trials, why God cuts us down, why God leaves us to languish in circumstances that are very unpleasant, why God does these things we don't always know. But the point is that we must trust God when we are in those circumstances. So Joseph trusted God, even though he was hoping to get out of the prison. Somehow he trusted God. He sensed that God had a higher purpose in the delay in bringing him out. And by the way, we are all to suffer from delay and disappointment. If you have not suffered from delay and disappointment in your life, you just haven't lived long enough. <laughs> Wait a while, it'll come back. <laughs> Somehow it will come to you at some point in time. So Joseph remained in prison, and the Bible tells us in verse 1 of chapter 41, it came to pass at the end of two full years that Joseph dreamed, or that, pardon me, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. So after Joseph had been in the prison for two years, let's think about this time now. Joseph was 17 when he was sent as a slave sold as a slave. He was 13 years in Potiphar's employment and two more years in prison. That's 15 years. And the Bible tells us that he was 30 years old uh, when he became and stood before Pharaoh, verse 46 of chapter 41. So actually... It's 13 years, really, um, from the time of being sold into slavery until the end of his prison term. So it was 11 years, pardon me, 11 years serving in Potiphar's house and two years in the prison. 13 years. He's now 30 years old when Potiphar, or when Pharaoh, um, meets him for the first time. Um, those two years in prison must have been very hard on Joseph. But friends, they were God's purpose. When, when, when Joseph had just given up all hope of getting out of prison, perhaps, that's when God works. <laughs> Sometimes when we, are, when we lose hope in any solution to the problem, when we give up and we say, okay, God, it's all up to you, you have to solve this problem. I can't solve it. That's when God steps in. When we realize that we have nothing that we can do to solve our problems and that only God is the one who can solve them, that's when God can say, all right, now I can work. So the sooner we learn that lesson, the better off we're going to be. Amen? So Pharaoh dreams a dream. And he cannot get the interpretation. And it says in verse 9 that he, uh, sorry, verse 8. It came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. Wow. You can imagine, messengers are sent from the palace early in the morning, almost at, at the beginning of sunrise, even before the sun is up in the sky. Messengers are going from the palace off to the homes of all of the magicians and all of the chief of the wise men of Egypt, all of them, and, and uh, they're all bidden to come quickly 
Don't worry about your shaving and your dressing. Just throw on some clothes. Come down to the palace. The king needs to see you right away. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but I can imagine. They, they were hasting to get these men to come to the palace for a conference with Pharaoh. And nobody, when they heard the dreams of Pharaoh, they were confounded, they, had, they were confused. They did not understand what the dreams meant. And these were the most significant wise men, the most significant magicians in all of Egypt. These were the men who were the diviners. These were the ones who knew the signs in the skies and in the sun and in the moon. And they could see the things that were happening and, and uh, they could divine them and, and try to interpret and predict them. But here they are confounded. The wisdom of man is foolishness with God. Oh. <coughs> How often has that been the case in the history of the world? where man thinks he knows more than God. He thinks that he is wiser than God. <laughs> and God is about to bring the wisdom of man down into the dust. So Pharaoh, uh, well, verse 9, it says, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh, you know, can you imagine, just imagine, just imagine the scene. Here we are in the palace, and there is this large congregation of wise men and magicians standing before Pharaoh. He tells them what his dreams were. They cannot interpret it. The butler is standing next to Pharaoh with the wine glass in his hand. Anytime that Pharaoh needs something to drink, he's right there with his drink. And over on the side is a man standing there like this. His name is Potiphar. He's watching the scene very carefully to make sure nothing wrong will happen. But he's also very interested in this unfolding story. And he stands there with his authority, his coat of authority, and his royal regalia. And he is standing there at attention watching the whole scene. And then the butler says, I remember my faults this day, O king. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants. He put me in ward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief butler, and we dreamed a dream in one night. And I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, and notice what he says, and Hebrew. And you know, my friends, when the Bible talks like this, we can understand this. Hebrews are Sabbath keepers. He says, and Hebrew, and we can understand this as a Sabbath keeper. Remember, in the last days, it is the Sabbath keepers who are at the full attention of the people of the world. If you're going to survive through the last days, you're going to come right into the focal point of all the people of the world because you keep God's law. And this is a way of saying in Hebrew, a Sabbath keeper. If you want to apply this to the end of time, of course. Servant to the captain of the guard, and now you see Potiphar's arms drop to his sides. And you think, what? What did he just hear? The captain of the guard, that's me. He's talking about Joseph. And the smile comes across his face because he knows what Joseph is capable of. In fact, Potiphar's been keeping Joseph a secret, <laughs> perhaps. But now the butler explains that Joseph was there with him in prison, and it says he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man, according to his dream, did he interpret. And it came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored to mine office, and him he hanged. Oh, Potiphar says, 
Is there really somebody who knows how to interpret dreams? So Pharaoh sent, verse 14, and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. Can you imagine? It's just about sunrise now. And suddenly there is someone coming to the prison to collect Joseph. And it says he shaved himself and changed his raiment. So he knew he was going to see Pharaoh. You know, you can imagine the messenger or the soldier or the guard coming to Joseph and saying, Pharaoh has called for you. What? Pharaoh? Yes, Pharaoh. Please come. All right, just a minute. Let me shave myself. Let me put on my clothes, the right clothes. I can't go there before Pharaoh in my prison garment. He's keeping Pharaoh at bay. He's keeping Pharaoh waiting while he's shaving and changing his clothes. But he's not going to be disrespected in the palace of Pharaoh by wearing prison clothes and coming unshaved. Now, the Hebrews did not normally shave themselves. It was a practice of the Hebrews not to shave. But in, in Egypt, it was um, the proper way to be at the higher levels of society to shave as we often do today. And Joseph was all things to all people, if you will, just as Christ is all things to all people. So Joseph shaved himself like an Egyptian. And he came and stood before Pharaoh in Egyptian clothes, shaved and standing there as if he was an Egyptian. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, verse 15, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it, and I have heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. But I want you to notice Joseph's answer. He answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. I don't have it. I cannot tell you your dream or the interpretation thereof. I cannot do it. It's not in me. God shall give, answer a, uh, give Pharaoh an answer of peace. It is God who gives the solutions to the dreams, not human flesh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kine, that's cows, fat, fleshed, and well-favored, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all the land of Egypt, for baldness. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind. And when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning. And so I awoke. Then I went back to sleep again, he says, and I saw another dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. <coughs> and behold, seven ears withered, thin and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. This is a strange story. <laughs> it's not realistic in some way. They devoured up the seven good ears, and I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it unto me. Can you declare it unto me, Joseph? And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. Isn't that wonderful? God always tells us what to expect. And if you want to know what to expect in the last days, get into your Bible. Study Bible prophecy. It's very clear. You learn from Elijah's story something about the end times. You learn from the story of Esther about the end of time. You learn from the story of Moses about the end of time, as well as the story of Joseph. I mean, the list goes on and on. 
You can even learn about the end of time from the life of Christ. The Bible is full of examples of what to expect, not to mention Bible prophecy. In fact, there are at least four ways that God gives us prophetic utterance that we may understand what to expect in the future. One of them is direct, interpret or direct prophecy. Noah, I'm going to bring a flood in 120 years, build an ark. And in 120 years, the flood comes. That's direct revelation. Then there is figures, types, and symbols. You know, beasts, women, stars, uh, sea. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. There's many of those symbols that God uses to tell us about prophetic things. And then the uh, third way in which God gives prophecy is through promises. Many of the promises of God have to do with direct prophecy. For example, Psalm 91. You know Psalm 91. Thou shalt not be afraid for the uh, terror by night or for the arrow that flieth by day. Terror by night is all about terrorism. Do we have terrorism today? Yes, of course we do. Or the arrow that flieth by day, an arrow is ammunition. Or it's war, it's referring to war and fighting. You know, thou shalt not be afraid for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, or the, or the what is it? Um, hang on, I <laughs> forgot the words exactly, just a second here. Um, it says, um, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Now, these are prophetic things that we can expect to happen, but the promise is that you won't be afraid of it. If you are in the secret place of the Most High, you will not fear these things. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. What a wonderful promise. But you can expect that there's going to be a lot of dead people all around you. A lot of bloodshed all around you. Violence. Violence of the storm, violence of war, violence of pestilence, and destruction at noonday, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, tsunamis, you know, all of these things. And don't think Copenhagen is going to escape. You see, the Bible uses these, these promises to describe future events as well. So there's three ways. The fourth way is through story and allegory. And through the story of the, the stories of the Old Testament and many of the stories of the New Testament, we learn what to expect in the last days, but not only that, we learn how to act when these things take place because of the people that acted in the stories of Scripture. You see? Very interesting, isn't it? So God gave Pharaoh an answer of peace. Verse 17, oh, sorry, verse, um, where were we? Uh, verse 26, the seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh through his prophet Joseph. You see, Joseph has now taken on a significance in, in Egypt as a prophet of the Lord. You see, Joseph was a prophet of God even back when he was prophesying to his brothers of his dreams. Joseph was a prophet of God when he prophesied to the butler and the baker in prison what would happen to them. And now he's a prophet of God to Pharaoh who needs to know what God is going to do in the future and he's going, how he's going to use Egypt. It's amazing to me that some years later, Pharaoh, who knew not Joseph, could actually put the Hebrews in slavery after what Joseph had done for, uh, for Egypt. It was because of Joseph that Egypt survived. Yet they forgot him and knew not Joseph. Now, <clears throat> 
<coughs> Joseph gives advice to the king. Verse 33. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out or find a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So you take one-fifth of all the produce of the land of Egypt and store it. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let him keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine." And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. All those men standing, all those magicians who had just been defeated by their, uh, them, by their own wisdom, now Joseph is coming and telling them what to do. And they saw that it, it was good. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. He's making Joseph prime minister and making himself a figurehead. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh, notice verse 42, Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures, that's vestures of fine linen, and put a gold chain on his neck. In other words, he gave Joseph a royal coat. Now get this. Joseph lost his coat with Mrs. Pharaoh, Mrs. Potiphar. And now he gets the coat of royal authority from Pharaoh himself. Think about that. Joseph's troublesome coat now becomes his blessing. That God has made him forget all of his troubles, except for his brothers, his church brethren, which we'll discuss this afternoon. But Joseph now has a coat that is actually going to put his brothers in a whole lot of trouble. And they're going to have many problems because of Joseph's code of authority. The very thing that his father had done for him as a child, now Pharaoh does for him as he is a man of 30 years. And he puts his coat on, his, head, his Egyptian headdress, no doubt, and a gold chain on his neck and a royal ring on his finger. And now Joseph is prime minister of all Egypt, and he rules everything. Potiphar, uh, uh, sorry, Pharaoh has found a man he could trust, a man he could put in full co control of the whole government and expect that everything will come out all right. And he gave him a wife, he gave him a new name, an Egyptian name, and uh, it says in verse 46 that Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Wow. Every crucifixion always is followed by a resurrection. And now Joseph was cut down by Potiphar's wife and he was in prison for two years. Now he's raised up to be the ruler of Egypt next to Pharaoh himself. Friends, this is a story that is very personal. It is very meaningful to me and to you because this can be our experience. If we're faithful to God, He will do these very things for us. Perhaps not exactly the same. All of us are different. But with every crucifixion, there will always be a resurrection. So this afternoon, we'll continue and finish the story of Joseph as he reconciles in a most powerful way with his brethren. God bless you.